Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh dear. I'm going the slow way today. It's only about a minute slower. But if you've listened to these podcasts before, you'll know that I do prefer it because it's more interesting. Oh no. I've got squeaky brakes now. Not only have I got a squeaky clutch, I've got squeaky brakes. You're listening to this, you're thinking, what's a clutch? <laughs> what's, what's he talking about, squeaky clutch? What's a clutch? <laughs> Next thing, he'll be talking about the choke. <laughs> yes, boys and girls, cars used to be very much less sophisticated. You uh, had to, on a cold day like today, the engine needed a slightly richer petrol mixture, fuel uh, fuel air mixture, and so rather than enriching the fuel, they used to restrict the air so that the mixture itself would then be richer in fuel, and that would uh, be necessary until the engine started to warm up, and then as you as the engine warmed up, you would gradually increase the air thereby decreasing the fuel air mixture the density of the fuel and uh, and eventually when the engine was operating at or near its normal temperature you, you know it ran lean which basically means with the minimum fuel uh, compatible with uh, efficient combustion <coughs> and so you used to have to pull the choke out if it was cold and uh, What a lot of people did was they would just drive for a couple of miles and then just push the joke in. But, but, if you understood the theory, you would just push the choke in a little bit, you know, for every like half a mile, push the choke in a bit more, and then that you'd get the best uh, result. Not that it, you know, you couldn't notice any difference or anything, but you certainly noticed if you pushed the choke in too soon. Because if you pulled the choke out and uh, got the car started, drove off up the road and then pushed the choke straight in, the car would just stop. Nowadays, that's all the uh, fuel-air mixture is controlled automatically. And that's pretty well standard on most cars. Although not on uh, many old planes. I, I uh, fly in an aircraft that has a choke. Mind you, in uh, an aircraft, it's slightly different because um, what you do is you're, uh, you want uh, a, a rich mixture at ground level where there's lots of oxygen and you need a leaner mixture, less fuel, when you're uh, at altitude, say three, four, five, ten thousand feet or whatever. And... Um, <clears throat> You can fly with a rich mixture at 10,000 feet, but most of the fuel doesn't get burned and just gets blown out of the exhaust. So what you're doing is you're just spending twice as much on fuel as you need to because half it you're just venting. So, <clears throat> so what you have to do is you have to make sure that the uh, mixture's fully rich to start, <clears throat> and then as you climb, you uh, check. You, you, uh, and you do it the other way around. You do it by restricting the fuel. So uh, instead of increasing the air. And the way that you know that you're doing it correctly is you sort of, you lean it until uh, the engine starts to, um, you, it sounds as though it's not running very well and, and then you go back a bit, you know, you just put it, you put it on, you pull it back until the engine sort of sounds horrible and then you just push it forward slightly and then you know it's pretty well properly leaned. But um, in some uh, engines they have a temperature gauge. This is aircraft engines. And basically what you do is you, <clears throat> as you, the, the excess fuel has a cooling effect on the exhaust gas temperature because of all this waste fuel that's being blown out of the back. 
Excuse me. So um, the temperature gets low, and then as you start to lean the mixture, the temperature rises. And then as you go past the point at which you've leaned it too much, the temperature starts to drop again because it's not burning efficiently. So the point at which the mixture is leaned correctly is the point at which the exhaust gas temperature <coughs> sensor is, is showing maximum temperature. Um, slightly, uh, perhaps slightly below because you don't really want to over lean an engine. And uh, over leaning an engine is um, a recipe for disaster because uh, engines don't run at all well if they're uh, running on uh, a mixture that's too doesn't have enough fuel in it <clears throat> they tend to get all sorts of um, uh, pinking and uh, premature explosions and all sorts of uh, you know things that shouldn't really happen in an engine I've got a bit of a sore throat today which is a pain I might take a COVID test when I get to work Despite the fact that I was being told that you know the vaccination was was pretty well 100 percent and uh, we're all going to be fine once we got vaccinated, we've all got vaccinated, and now we're told that in fact we're not all fine, and uh, you're just as likely to pass COVID on or catch it if you've been vaccinated, if as if you haven't. But uh, the difference being that you're less likely to be seriously ill and and end up in hospital. So, uh, it could be just could be just a seasonal sore throat. We sort of tend to forget that we ever used to be sick. COVID's the only disease that anyone ever thinks about or remembers now. You know, people don't re remember sort of uh, travelling on trains with people who are constantly blowing their noses or getting on planes sitting in front of people that are constantly coughing. Stand in the road and see what's coming. Why well, don't you? Good idea. I think he's been caught short. That's why he's so interested in what's coming down the road. He's going to have to be quick on this road because there are a few cars on it. Anyway, how are you? How are you? I forgot to ask how you are. How are you? All right? going to see the James Bond movie this afternoon. It's the end of the week. We work three full days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we normally we try not to work Thursday, but we're booked Thursday morning up because, um, like I say, I'm going on a holiday in about three weeks' time. <coughs> oh, that's assuming I don't die in the meantime, you know. I could be. 217 deaths yesterday within one month of taking a positive COVID test so in a couple of weeks it could be me who knows life's a bitch and then you die well my life hasn't really been a bitch it's been alright actually fast over the humpback bridge I don't know what they're going to do about this bridge it's been like this for about two years now so <clears throat> we had the uh, our policy of uh, refusing to accept patients is going really well we had a, we had, I told you about this lady who had a phobia about having scale and polishing and then we read her notes and she said she wasn't very happy with her previous dentist and so that, that was two red lights and so that's it one one we can possibly cope with and probably won't in future and two definitely is a firm no 
I've got a ground prep on a young lady today. She's got, she's had a ton of work done. She's uh, got, <clears throat> she's in her 30s, I think, or early 40s. She's got 12 root femurs, 10 crowns, a three unit bridge, an implant. We've got her on our dental plan. God knows how that happened. I think because we have got people with lots of crowns on the dental plan, but they tend to be people that I've done all the crowns. Which is the first time we took on someone who someone else has done all the crowns. And what's happened is I think a lot of them have been done without posts. And a lot of them have just been done with some sort of cheap uh, porcelain, you know, they're not even bonded crowns. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this ground for her, which is fair enough. Get her dentally fit, and then and then tell her that we can't uh, keep her on the plan. Which is <coughs> it's always very difficult to know how to say to people that you don't want to keep them on the plan because they suspect that you um, are throwing them off because uh, they're costing you more money. And they see the um, they see the arrangements of you know them paying monthly for their treatment is in the wrong way. Um, they see it either as <coughs> a way of sort of budgeting, which which it might be, but that's not really the whole point. It's not to allow people to pay for lo loads of restorative dentistry and instalments. And that's absolutely not what it is. It's um, or they see it as a, a bet between me and them, <coughs> where <coughs> if they get more dentistry than they've paid for, or than, than they're paying for, then they win. And if um, I manage, if they don't need as much dentistry, then lucky me, you know? <laughs> you don't really think about the preventive component of it at all, or... Uh, <coughs> and the way I, I explain it is, look, you know, we... we and we had to explain it like this because when uh, COVID came, there were a lot of people who said, you know, I'm not, I can't come into the surgery. Why should I carry on paying? Or more commonly, they say, I haven't had anything done. Why should I carry on paying into your dental plan when it's obviously would be cheaper just to go back on a pay as you go basis. So to which the answer is, look, you know, Everybody has makes a decision as to whether or not they, they're insurance minded. Some people have got insurance on their boiler. They've got insurance in case their drains get blocked. Uh, you know, they're, they're just happy to pay a fixed amount each month and get rid of the headache of having to find a ton of money if anything goes wrong. Well, <coughs> from my experience about two-thirds of patients are not like that they just want to find the money they've either got enough money to be able to put their hands in their pockets and find find a 1500 quid if they need to or they haven't got any money which includes any money to pay into a dental plan so the way we set the fees is that on balance everything works out so it swings and roundabouts so in any one month, the total amount of money coming in has to be equal to the total amount of money going out. That's what it. That's all it is. And we don't try and push the monthly fees up any higher than that. Um, and we'd be stupid to because if we, uh, you know, made sure that every month we had twice as much money coming in as was going out we'd have far few people on the plan far fewer people on the plan we have to keep it competitive we have to balance the chances of you needing treatment with the chances of you having to pay for treatment you know the, with your monthly premium so <clears throat> someone who says to me uh, shall I you know should I leave the plan that is my stock answer that your fee is set based on your, the risk, to your risk to us. 
and um, it's balanced very finely in that you know some years you might win and some years I might win but overall it's fair to both of us and that's how the premium sat and therefore if you leave the plan which they think that this is going to mean some great you know I'm going to be really upset about this because my my sinecure you know my monthly income from them is going to cease so they're like they're saying you know how about what you got to say to that you know suppose I leave the plan and I'm, I'm like very much like well <clears throat> because the fee is risk based um, <clears throat> it just depends on who you want to have the responsibility should anything go wrong if you leave the plan then obviously it's you who will adopt the responsibility for paying for it to be fixed if you stay on the plan then it is me it is I Leclerc who has to pay who has the responsibility for paying to get things fixed. I tell them there's no third party, I'm the underwriter, and basically every month we just pay for whatever needs doing out of all the money that comes in from all the people who are entitled to have things done. So whether you uh, leave the plan, join the plan, leave and then join the plan is entirely neutral from my point of view. All, all I'll do is I'll make a record on your notes that you've said, you've decided, that should anything go wrong with your teeth, you will bear the responsibility of funding whatever remedial work is required. And paying for your own checkups. And, and if you want to see the hygienist, then you'll have to book in and pay to see the hygienist, etc. So, you know, when you explain it to them like that, they're a bit more like, oh, okay, oh, I didn't quite understand exactly what how that works, you know. And it does work like that, because... Oh, thank you. Here we go. No, it does work like that because, um, well, I've been doing this job a long time. So it doesn't really bother me whether people go on the plan or not, but you have to make sure that the people on the plan are correctly categorised. That is rule number one. <clears throat> and you have to... Uh, uh, make sure that uh, you know you can't if someone's supposed to be paying uh, if they're a D and you've got them down as a B that's a disaster because you'll just make a loss on, on their treatment and you should adjust people between bands so like um, <coughs> had a guy in yesterday <clears throat> did some vitamins on him in his early 40s got a massive cavity we had him down as a B so that immediately puts him up as a C because he's, his risk profile has changed. He's obviously still got a sweet tooth. We're obviously going to possibly be doing fillings on him from time to time. We'll give him dietary advice. Hopefully that'll uh, kick down the cost to us. <clears throat> but he, he, uh, he has to shoulder an increased cost because he's, he's, you know, he's demonstrated he's an increased risk. And it's not like, um, you know, it's not like, you know, you can carry on paying the same amount, providing you don't need any treatment. And then if you do need any treatment, then then we bump your premium up, you know. It's not it's not like car insurance, where if you have an accident, they you lose your no claims. The, the reason why his premium went up was because it became apparent that he was miscategorised with regard to risk. Because you don't really expect a 40 year old with otherwise good looking teeth to uh, get massive great cavities. And that's the reason why this young lady was, he's going to become unsuitable for the scheme. Because uh, although all her root treatments have done, been done pretty well, the restorative work has been done a bit, um, well, there's we no posts of cause and, and, and porcelain only crowns. Um, you know, it's there's going to be some maintenance requirement there. So, so it's become apparent to me that 
her crowns have not been done to a very high standard, let's put it that way. They've possibly been done with a porcelain that is, is prone to fracture and uh, therefore this is not the first and won't be the last porcelain crown that we're going to need to replace. And bearing in mind you've got 12 of them, you know, we could end up having to replace all 12. Now let's say that we kept her on the scheme. Then uh, what we'd have to do is come up with a monthly premium that was appropriate for the level of risk that she posed. And with 12 crowns made out of prob probably dodgy porcelain, she's going to need to be paying about £300 a month, isn't she? Premium for that risk. So... <clears throat> It's a shame I didn't nip out and block you off sooner. The cheeky bastards, they come round this junction, they've just repainted it. Look, all the paint's fresh and they haven't solved the problem, which is that there's a roundabout <clears throat> where one lane in goes into two lanes out and the second lane out is supposed to be the turning right lane to that junction back there. But people know that if they overtake all the cars on the way up to the roundabout and go round the roundabout on to the right and straight into the second lane and then they try and push in the straight ahead traffic. Prime example. <clears throat> yeah, so, so it's not a case of chucking her off. <coughs> it's a case of being in, in keeping with my policy of being strictly fair to the patient and strictly fair to us in terms of the uh, cost of the risk that they present. A, a recategorization of her risk shows that she is she's well ahead, well outside the parameters of any sort of risk that we are normally prepared to accept on the plan. She wasn't when she joined, but she is now. So, so, uh, but that, no, but we'll still fix her up. I'll get her crown done and everything, and make sure she's perfectly fit and healthy. And then I'll tell her that you know, she's not, she's not an A, B, C, D, or an E. She's an actually yeah, an M. She puts 300 quid away a month towards her dentistry instead of paying it towards me, towards my plan. She'll have enough money to pay for any crowns that she needs anyway. Well, I must just tell you very quickly, there's someone yesterday had an occlusal filling, the smallest filling we do, two millimetres across. Been quoted 500 pounds in King's Cross for this filling. We did it for 93. She'd also been quoted to uh, see the hygienist four visits, 400 pound a visit. And she didn't even need a scale and polish. Sometimes I despair of my colleagues. A lovely lady as well, you know, really didn't deserve it. Nobody, nobody really deserves that. So, um, Right, I'm nice and early, so I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee. Nice to talk to you. See you soon. Bye.